Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be doing the fall feast uh, beginning. We've done all the we've done the spring feast. We did the summer feast, and uh, now beginning the fall feast. And that will be begin in Leviticus 20. My wife informed me but my writing is awful. So, you know, just I, so, okay. <laughs> uh, but with that done, we're doing the fall feast. We've got the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? In the Feast of Trumpets, you've heard it's, it's Rosh Hashanah. Now, you, you hear a lot. Jews in, in America or people in America, they call it Rosh Hashanah, okay? So, but that's what that is. Right? They wouldn't recognize that that in Israel, you know, speaking that way, but, uh, and for language people, there you are, and so I'll read in Leviticus 23, we're going to be looking at some scripture, I hope I can finish today on this part, we'll pick up some next week probably, but in Leviticus 23 and verse 23, and it says, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall, you shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, and there shall you offer a, uh, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And that's all it says in that particular section, Leviticus, about the Feast of Trumpets. So, so far, we've seen, as we've seen the first four feasts, they were all fulfilled on the very day that they uh, typified. Um, last week, we saw the early summer feast of, of uh, Pentecost, this um, 50 days after first fruits. And today also that the Jews celebrate the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. So in that, what we've seen thus far, we see a blood-bought people who are walking out of Egypt, a type of the world, and they identify with the baptism of Moses, and they are then empowered with the identity of the law given to them 50 days later, okay, on that. And all that we see 1,400 years later, how the Lord told his church, these people are blood, they're already saved. He, he told them they're, they're, their names are written in the book, or, or written in heaven already. I mean, these people are already saved. They've been baptized, of course, they're walking with the Lord, but they would be, the church would be empowered. And that day it was. And uh, with the Holy Ghost, and so if you remember, there's people, if you ever have someone challenge you, have you ever been baptized by the Holy Ghost? You, you don't need to fear that question. Just tell them you haven't and neither have I. No, none of us have. Uh, all, if you're saved, you've been sealed by the Holy Ghost forever. You're sealed, okay? That's not baptized. Two different words, totally. That baptism, overwhelming with the power, and it came with manifestations, that speaking other languages that you've never learned. I'm sorry, I've never seen someone, uh, if it was sealing, that would mean the moment someone got saved, they would start doing that, okay? I've never done that. I don't know of anything else. So uh, it's different. That, that was given in four places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost part, we saw boom, boom, boom. They're all fulfilled exactly, and that was done, okay? And it was assigned to the Jews and so on. Now, another reason that you know that people often that, that claim that they've had this, uh, the Holy Ghost is holy. We sometimes almost forget that. The Holy Ghost is holy. And if you've had some kind of a overwhelming with the Holy Ghost, then I would guess that probably that would make you really holy too, and when you see people, that just in, they, they have disregard of what the Bible teaches on things, or they're selective, they're not holy, and yet they're talking about they were baptized with the Holy Ghost. So, I mean, automatically you know that they're misled on something. And maybe you can help them with that. I mean, it doesn't mean they're necessarily, uh, they might be well-meaning, they might not be. Who knows? But, all right, going on. Now, today we begin looking at these feasts. And, uh, and so we named them, um, the trumpets and so on, the, the, and the tabernacles. And so following the Feast of Trumpets will be the Day of Atonement. It's called Yom Kippur, which is, that means Day of Atonement. But that's what you'll hear the Jews say that. And anyway, this is an awful time. This is when they afflict themselves. And it's just, a, and we'll see what that typifies. <clears throat> there is no greeting for this day as far as a happy, don't say happy holiday. Um, that on that day they say Hatimatova, which means have a good signature, which means hopefully you'll be, you'll make it and have your name written in the book of life. I, you know, it's religion, okay? It's not Bible. Uh, but and then so anyway, so but this one here, the Feast of Trumpets, um, and of course we've seen they've all had an immediate application at that time, and they also have a prophetic application. Now, if the Jewish days um, are not confusing enough. They also have, there's a more confusion, they have two New Years. Yeah, it, it actually gets more complicated than that, but let's just leave it right there. 
they actually have two New Years because they have a civil New Year and they have a religious New Year. Passover begins the religious year. But this one is when Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year, all right, or first of the year. And so this is their New Year's, all right, greeting. And they'll say the greeting there is Shana Tova, which, you know, Tov is good. And so, you know, a good year, or in, in their way, year good. But uh, <clears throat> that's the greeting for that. And, and so this, the feast will begin this year, just so you get an idea what time of year it normally falls on will be October 2nd this year. Now, the Jews believe that that's the day that God created the earth is when they celebrate uh, Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. Now, we have no idea about that, but they've got about 365 and one-fourth chances out of, you know, that 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 might be right. I don't know. (laughs) You know, one out of 365. So uh, you might as well pick a day. Good thing, you know, if if God created the heaven and the earth during hunting season, I think I like that idea. But uh, anyway, so... All right, uh, and the, one of the things also the Feast of Trumpets serves as is a signal warning because you've got 10 days between here, between these days, and, and 10 days, it's called the Days of Awe, and those are the days that they're preparing themselves for this because this is, I mean, they, they believe their salvation depends on this. They believe it, but in a very religious way, not very consistent. One time I was dealing with a, with a uh, Jewish fellow that was in Israel, and uh, I was dealing with him, and he was under great conviction. He'd committed adultery, and he was feeling really bad. He'd gone, he'd, he'd, he'd been on a trip somewhere, and he fell, and he was really feeling the guilt of it. And I was dealing with him about the salvation through the blood of Christ, and he's listening to me. He's looking for help to get over this sin, over this guilt. And then right then, I saw it, I could see it in his eyes. He said, oh, you know what, uh, Yom Kippur's coming, I'll just take care of it then. You could see the little bird take that seed away and fly off with it. You know, it's like, so they resorted to religion instead of Christ. Okay, that's, that's idolatry when you get into, you know, but at the basic, the very basic meaning of it. But anyway, uh, they, those days, they're preparing themselves for the Day of Atonement when they, they eat nothing, they, they don't drink and, uh, you know, they afflict themselves and they pray all the time. And I'll talk about that next week. Uh, what they do is they eat apples and honey. It's, and they wish for a sweet year and, uh, and so on. Now, on the prophetic aspect, that was the immediate aspect. But there's a prophetic aspect of all those. You remember, um, that as we dealt with Passover, represents the blood of the lamb, right? The salvation, all right? And the Feast of Unleavened Bread represents the holy body of Christ, who is his body, physical body in the tomb, but he was without sin. And, uh, and so first fruits represents his resurrection. And then we saw last week, we saw the, on, on Pentecost, where the law, giving of the law parallels with uh, the, the baptism, of the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now, so what could trumpets possibly represent? The Feast of Trumpets. I'm kind of, it's kind of a rhetorical question. But what would we think? Well, the Bible gives it, uh, the, the, the Bible gives some very clear uh, things in the New Testament. So if we will turn to some familiar passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15. Now these are all fulfilled in the order that God gave them. And as he gave them, boom, every one of them fell in that order. In 1 Corinthians 15, in verse 51 and 52, it's a very familiar passage. We need to look at it though, because there's some words in there we want to look at. <clears throat> so if you found there, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. Okay, there's your trumpet. We've got another one uh, 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 passage that we're going to deal with too. But the trumpet was used to gather God's people for war or for to strike the tents and let's move out. But it was a gathering, you know, they, for, that's what the trumpet was used. And, uh, and so on Rosh Hashanah, the, the trump is in a series. They use the trumpet and they blow it in a series. Now, it's usually, if you, has anyone ever heard it before when they blow it? Because they, they'll have it on the Internet. They'll show them when they're blowing. And they have the ram's horn. And it usually, and it, forgive me, I'll try to mimic it. It goes, burr, 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 burr. And there's six short burst and the last one is burr, and that's how they do it 
So if I could have had one, I could have demonstrated it. And maybe we could have Brother Jim do it, but it's not the same as a ram's horn, but it would, you know, but six short ones and then the last one, that's the last trump. That's what that is. Now, this is just less Potter theology here. I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't hear, burp, 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 burp. I, you know, I, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe only God will hear the first part, but we're going to hear the last trump. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't, we're like, what's that noise? We're, you know, and it may come really quick, but we'll, we may hear those first six as it's going, and last trump, we're gone. We're out of here. All right. Wouldn't that be glorious? <laughs> and so, now, um, and so, anyway, now, note something here. The trumpet is singular here. There's only one, just one trumpet, what he's giving there. Now, there is an antithesis to that, and that's why we need to look at that. There's, an, you know, there's a, a thesis and an antithesis. There's the opposite of this, and I don't have a lot of time to, to deal with this but um, here, but need to mention it, is in Revelation 8, there are seven trumpets in the, the last half of the great tribulation time, and these are not for the people of God. Those, these are for the enemies of God, and there are seven individual ones, and each one of them blows another woe. Boom, and it comes. The last one blows, it not only, it starts and then there's the vials that come out and all these other plagues and all these horrible things that come on the enemies of God on the earth, okay? Now these, this is the opposite of the trump that's blowing for the, pe the, the people of God. The trump that raises the dead in Christ and summons, summons us home to be with the saints will, will um, occur before the next of these seven Sabbaths, okay? This is... You know, we've done the first four. I don't have had another board, but so there's this one. It comes before this one. Now you understand that, that this is going to be the time of Jacob's trouble, and then what the Lord calls the worst time ever came upon earth. It's going to be a problem. He's going to be dealing with Israel specifically, but the whole world in general, the wrath of God is going to fall upon the earth. So this one happens before that one. All right, and it's there's a it's different trumpets. That there's given. There's a number of Bible proofs on that. Now, by the way, what the Lord described it is the great tribulation, such as never, or not since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor ever shall be. So it's bad. We've had a lot of tribulation in this world. There's been a lot of horrible times. We we know there's you know we look at the churches of Asia. The, the God talked about or the Lord talked about you know some of them would have ten days of just that's horrible tribulation. But that's the wrath of man. This is going to be the wrath of God. The trumpet blows before that, and God promised in Revelation 3.10 that we'll be spared of that. Okay? Now, there, there's, uh, there's some other biblical proofs on that, but let's keep it simple. Relative to the study of the feasts, the order of God's program is demonstrated prophetically with the first four feasts fulfilled perfectly. I don't think God's going to change his order in the next one. The reason I say that, there are religious systems that uh, require a different order, and they want to, they'll, they'll, they'll acknowledge the first four, but they want to start mixing and matching over here. And you can't, you're not going to do that. God gave the order. There's no place to conjecture when you go outside of what God's word is, is given, okay? And so we want to, uh, our eschatology, do you remember what that is? Prophecy, the study of last things. It needs to be, it's important. It's not, sometimes people think that be, things that haven't happened yet are up for grabs. You can just sort of guess. No, no, because God revealed it. What he's revealed, we need to follow, and there's a reward for this, for loving his appearing, the loving the way he gave it. Now, let me mention something needful here um, on this. Now, the saints are promised, as I mentioned, that, they'll be, that they will be spared this time of God's wrath on earth. But we're not told we'll be saved from man's wrath. The world, there's, I mean, Christians and saints have been persecuted, burned at the stake. They've had their homes taken from them. They've been drowned. They've been, you, if you want to look at Martyr's Mirror, you look at some of the horrible things they would do to people, bury them alive if they wouldn't recant their baptism. Um, they, I mean, they, women and children, they would burn them alive and bury them alive. And all those, all those things are the wrath of man. Don't think, we, we in America, we're really spoiled. We haven't seen that kind of persecution. Um, as late as 1760s, there were Baptists that were er, prosecuted in uh, courts of law for preaching the gospel without a license. We're talking a very short be time before the revolution. 
and the Baptist would be prosecuted, jailed, confiscation of property, just for preaching the gospel without a license of the state church. That's being persecuted by man, by, by other fellow Christians. All right, so after the revolution, and we gained where we have the freedom, you know, the First Amendment rights, and that kind of took the teeth, and we also don't have to pay taxes to the state church, which Baptists protested that. Uh, we don't, by the way, if I had time, the Bill of Rights, if, if you know the story of the Bill of Rights, there, there's a lot involved there, but you could almost call it the Baptist Bill of Rights because it was influenced by John Leland. To, yeah, it, it, but if I get down that, I won't be able to finish here. There's a lot there, but the, boy, I'd love to get on that one. But, but there, no, there's so much, there's so much. We wouldn't have those Bill of Rights if it weren't for, because Baptists have been so persecuted they didn't want to, this, anyway, uh, he had so much influence uh, to get the state of Virginia to come on board with, with the, the Constitution. He said, well, by these conditions, because there's so many Baptists involved. And so, anyway, I got to get into this. Um, so, let me see. So, we consider all the millions. By the way, it's not just in past. You know, it wasn't that long ago, we, there's Baptist brethren that are persecuted in the Soviet Union, horribly pers persecuted. And, uh, and so has anyone ever seen the, name, the, the printing, that book? It's a J Bob Jones movie years ago. It just sort of captured a little bit of it. It's called The Printing, where they're printing Bibles, and they're, they're trying to get away from the government and everything. And they're per they were horribly uh, even tortured, you know. But um, to this day, there are Christians in, in communist China and in North Korea suffering horribly for the faith. That is, you know, that the wrath of man is, is bad enough. I'm glad we're going to escape the wrath of God and that God promised that. But the wrath of man is surely bad enough. And we're overdue for persecution. If you look at the cycles of history, we're overdue. So we don't want to be naive to think, well, and I've actually heard Christians say that. I've talked about, you know, there's persecution coming. There very well could be we could go to jail for the faith. Um, we could be having to die for the faith. Oh, no, no, we'll be raptured before that. I'm like, you, you know, you, you don't know anything about history or even the Bible in that regard because we very well could go through lots of pain and tribulation for the faith. And it, it, it could be something the Lord would purify, um, you know, the, the saints before, the, before he blows that, that, that trumpet. And we could go through a purification. Uh, and that's what tribulation does. All right, so um, and thank God that we won't see the wrath of God. Now, if you will, let's turn to another one. This is First Thessalonians chapter four. <clears throat> and they're familiar passages, but let's again let's look at the words. First Thessalonians chapter number four and verse fifteen. And so, and you've heard this. We've heard this many times. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, what does it say? Who's going to be? We call this the rapture. Rapture is not in the Bible, but neither the word Bible is not in the Bible either. Okay, so we, we, it's a useful term. We say rapture, but we're not. It's catching away, but it's easy to say rapture. We know what that means. So who's this going to be raptured here? Um, that if you look back in, in chapter 3 and verse 13, chapter 3 and verse 13, just the verse before chapter 4, to the end that you may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the beginning of the Lord, or at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. All right. All right. Just a rhetorical question then. Who, who is going to be returning with the Lord? Saints, right? Saints. Okay. We're all good. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, and what are saints? Are they super Christians? Or what are they? What are saints? Yes, sir. Believers. If you're saved, that you're counted as a saint. Now, to be a saved, how are we saved? By the blood of Christ, right? Believe it, yeah. Receive, as many as we received him to them, gave you power to become the son of God, even them that believe on his name. 
That's how you become a saint. Now, what about baptism in church? Are we saved by baptism? Are we saved by church affiliation? So salvation and church, you're saying, are different, correct? You can be saved. Now, by the way, if you're saved, you ought to be part of a Bible-believing New Testament church. Should you not? But is everybody that's saved part of a New Testament church? Do you, anyone know of saved Protestants? I do. My grandparents were godly, you know, uh, Wesleyan Methodists. They never, never became part of a New Testament church. So we say the common popular saying people say, and we hear it so much we don't even question it, is we hear the rapture of the church. It's not the rapture of the church. It's the rapture of the saints. The Bible uses the word saints, not church. And we don't want to confuse the two because in the Bible, salvation and church are two different things. Now, that's not the case in Catholicism or Protestantism. In their doctrine, they are the same. If you're put out of the church, you are basically your salvation is in, you know, in jeopardy. All right, that, that's in doctrine. You know, and that's why historically, and people say, you know, we thought the church. And the, the, even though the Bible uses the term church sometimes in that sense, um, the grammatical term is called a synecdoche. It's like when I say the dog is man's best friend. That doesn't mean there's one dog. Okay, we, under, we understand what that means, right? When I talk about the Bible says, that doesn't mean there's only one Bible here. We have a bunch of Bibles in all of your laps. So, I'm, you know what I'm saying? When we use a singular term for a plural uh, in that regard, the Bible does that just a few places. And, but we understand by context what it means. So it's very important that we use because people build doctrine on false ways of saying that, you know. And so and we all say it. It, it slips because you hear it so often, you know. But anyway, so uh, the churches which the Lord founded in his earthly ministry was a visible group of disciples whom he trained. He gave them ordinances and he gave them a commission to reproduce themselves and that they would continue until he returned. Amen. And so that's what the Lord called church. And but the rapture is for all the saints, not just the church. It's not just for the Baptists. Amen? Amen. I've heard of people that believe that, but I've never, I've met people who I was told that they believed that and they didn't believe it that way, but I was told, I think it's a misunderstanding, but I've heard that there are people that think only the Baptists will be raptured. So I'd like to meet one of those to find out really, do you really believe that? And so, because I would show them the saints, okay? All right, now this catching away is our blessed hope. And it involves a resurrection here of the saints. So as we, as we know, resurrection was the cornerstone of the gospel. We've seen that when we're looking at the Feast of First Fruits. And we just barely scratched the surface. We're talking about Christ's resurrection. But the resurrection of the saints is, it goes uh, uh, all the way from back to the Garden of Eden. You know, that, that's going to be a glorious day when you think about... Actually, you know, because I don't know about how you see it, but in my mind, it's almost surreal. It's, it's kind of like, I believe it, but to actually see someone who you knew was, has passed away that's now just as alive as we are, that would be an amazing thing. i got a lot of questions to ask a lot of people when it comes to that time. There are two people at least that I want to talk to. I would love to talk to this side of the rapture. I would like to talk to them right now. If I could. Now, I won't be able to, but I'd love to. Two people. One's my dad. We weren't very close. Uh, my dad didn't get saved, but there's some things I really need to talk about. Another one you, you might not believe. Does anyone remember Alvin Cox? Do, Pastor, were you here when Alvin Cox was here? He, Miss Kathy's dad. I would, those are two people that I've known in my life that I would like to talk to right now. And someday I will talk to Brother Alvin. You, you might not understand why, but there's some things that Brother Alvin was a huge influence on me more than he knew on a number of things. I know he would give some great encouragement. But we will be able to sit and talk to Brother Abraham and Brother Isaac, Brother Jacob. Amen. We'll be able to sit and talk with them actually physically. That's amazing. All right. So there was, um, this is mentioned, that it's the, the resurrection is the cornerstone. Now, contrary to the system that I was taught in Bible college, the Old Testament saints knew a lot more about the gospel than what these systems, of uh, these theologians of different systems can give credit for that they can. Basically, I was taught that they, nobody was saved until Pentecost, which is completely, I mean, you know, we've seen that's not even true. It's not possible. But um, the Lord even said people, his disciples, their names are written in heaven long before that. But, you know, I think that Noah would argue with that. 
he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, David would argue with that one. But I think that they actually knew more about the gospel, the gospel, than what people give credit for. Let me read you something from Job. Job 19, verse 25. This is what he said. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. This man is talking about the Redeemer, and he's talking about the resurrection, and he's a contemporary of Abraham. So he knew something about the gospel. And there's more to that. Now, Abraham, if you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter number 3. When I saw this little nugget, I was, it was, maybe, you know, it might not be a nugget for anyone else. You might have seen this before. You might know this. Like, yeah, yeah. But for me, I was long after, I mean, I'd been in the ministry and I saw this. I'm like, I got, the, the, the just, it was like an eye opener. In verse 8, Galatians 3, 8. It says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through the faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. Abraham had the gospel 430 years before the law. 430 years. Now, if you look in, um, also in, in verse 19... With that understanding that the gospel existed before the law, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed should come to the promise was made, or whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. All right, so the gospel existed before the law. The law was added. And by the way, the law brings us to the gospel. I love that approach because in our day and age, it's different than in the 70s when I was, you know, I remember as a kid in church, people would come forward in every service and get saved. People were always getting saved. And, and you could preach the love of Jesus and people would come weeping to the altar and get, they want to get saved. We're, we're way past that. The law, Spurgeon talked about the law is the needle that, that drives that, you know, that, and it pulls the silver thread of, of God's forgiveness and grace to heal. Well, the law, we're at the time now, you talk to people and they say, I've never done anything wrong. I'm, I'm a good person. They'll look you right in the eyes and say, I'm a good person. And uh, so that's why I go, oh, have you never lied? Have you ever? And you can go down the line. And uh, like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well then, you know, what do you call that? You, you're a liar, right? <laughs> you know, you're, have you ever taken anything? You're a thief. Have you ever lusted after someone of the opposite sex? You're an adulterer. All right, so now where do you stand with God? You're a lion, thief, and adulterer. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> you know? Well, I like that approach because it's very timely for our time in these last days. Um, but <clears throat> So the law was given, at, but so he understood the gospel. Now we're going to go on with that a little bit here. So the gospel that Abraham knew, if you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> he knew 430 years before the law was given. And he knew that this... Gospel includes the resurrection. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Hebrews 11 and verse 17. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it is said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. He knew that Isaac would be the progenitor of, you know, from, from now on. And yet God's saying, go offer him as an offering. Well, obviously, God doesn't lie, so God is going to raise him from the dead. But he already knew the, he knew the gospel, and it's the resurrection included it. All right? And so it's in, in, in verse 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. And so here it is, the place where Abraham took Isaac is Mount Moriah. That's where Jerusalem stands. That's the same mountain where the Lord was on uh, where he said it is finished and gave and died for us in that same place and uh, where the Lord was crucified and rose again. Now the Jews believe that on this day, the Feast of Trumpets, is when Abraham, is the very day that Abraham bound Isaac. 
and put him on the altar. And that's called Akedak, Akedat Itzhak. That's what the name of it is. And it means the binding of Isaac. And, and they celebrate that the very day on Rosh Hashanah. You know, they, they uh, attribute that. And <clears throat> the, the rabbis even say, now we don't give any credence to religion. I, I'm just saying this is just, a, it's amazing how blind they are. They even say that Abraham was told to blow the ram's horn as a reminder of the substitutional sacrifice provided by the Lord himself. Do you remember when, when Isaac said, where is the lamb? And he, I, Abraham said, God will provide himself a lamb. He didn't say for him. He said himself a lamb. And so, and what, what they found in the thicket was not a lamb. It was a ram. Okay, so all, it shows that all this is, you know, we're talking about the Lord that's going to come. And so uh, Abraham knew this redeemer. And so that he blew that ram's horn and that's the trumpet. Now the Jews believe in their Talmud, which is not inspired. Okay. It's just extra biblical. But, um, in, in the book, it's called the book of Rosh Hashanah 16 B. It says that the dead will be raised on this feast of trumpets. Well, they understood something. And by the way, that's what the Bible says, that the dead will be raised on the feast of trumpets when the Lord returns. And, uh, and so, before the Lord raised Lazarus from the dead, you remember Martha said in John eleven twenty four, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now she only had the Old Testament, but she understood that he would be the resurrection, he would be raised again. And then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so uh, he is the redeemer that Job professed 18 centuries before that. All right, so the Feast of Trumpets, as I mentioned, signals the 10 days of awe, the time of affliction. And that is going to be the time when the high priest is going to make atonement and he's going to be he's going to reconcile the people to God. Now, who, of course, we're going to look at who the high priest is. I think you all know, right, our great high priest. And he's going to make that reconciliation and the people are going to be reconciled to God at that time, Israel. And um, <clears throat> let me see. And he's going to enter. That's when the, the priest, then he would go into the Holy of Holies and do that once a year. All right. A lot of people presume that the rapture is going to start the tribulation period. The Bible doesn't say that. The, we understand the tribulation period will begin when the man of sin, he confirms a covenant with many. And when he does that, it's going to be for one week. It's a week of years. It's even written in Hebrew, week of years, and that's the way it's written. Okay, so it, it is, but we understand it by context. It's seven years he's going to make that. Con that's when it begins. So why is there ten days between here and there, not seven? You know, if you, I always heard that, wow, after the rapture, as soon as that happens, the tribulation begins, and uh, like, wow, that's going to be really fast for that 144,000 to suddenly get saved the day after the rapture. Because you're going to, you know, but I think there could very well be three years in there. It makes a lot of sense and it answers things. We understand that um, the, there's the battle of Gog and Magog in, in Ezekiel 38 and 39. They're going to come with, with primitive weapons and they're going to attack the, the uh, of unwalled villages, the country. They're going to attack Israel and they're going to be wiped out by God. I think that's a perfect time where this man of sin is going to step up and say, I did it. And he's going to confirm a covenant with these people at that time and you know all give them peace you know in that regard they're gonna think man he is really great um so we got the 144,000 jewish men i think there's gonna be a little bit of time they're gonna discover a bible and they're gonna be saved they're, they're, they may be beginning to build the temple and that third temple by the way is not the temple that christ will build it's going the one that, that christ builds is gonna be so big it won't even fit right there right now there's gonna be land changes so um, but they're going to build the third temple. Don't ever donate to a third temple project because you're donating to the temple of the Antichrist, okay? <laughs> Just so you don't. And anyway, and that's, about, that's what I have. I don't, I don't know if we have a, a, does anyone have any pressing questions? Do we have another horn to blow, right? So <laughs> maybe there'll be six of them and then a, a long one. So does anybody have a, <laughs> All right. did I answer everything or did I just, I, I may have talked too fast. Yes, sir. It was good. I answered it all. Oh, that's scary. So, all right. Well, then, if if we've answered, is it interesting? Is it becoming that way? All right. How it's all fitting together. We just follow God's program. We look at His, and He's told us why. And you know why it's important right now. There's a lot of 
uh, other ideas going around. People are convincing people that we're going to go through the tribulation period. We may go through great a lot of tribulation, but not the wrath of God. We've been promised against it. So now these are some things you understand. And they say, well, your they say that uh, what they call pre-tribulationalism is new. That began with a charismatic girl in Scotland and you know came up with the idea. They say that. Uh, the Darfield, or Schofield in, in Derby came up with it, these Protestant guys. And I say, no, they actually learned some things from the Baptists who believed the Bible. And there's a lot of Protestants that went pre-tribulational in the 1800s, or 1900s, rather. Uh, but this goes back, I say, well, you know what? Paul was pre-trib, and Jesus was pre-trib. And they laugh, and I say, okay, if that's not old enough, how about Moses? Moses was pre-trib. And then if that's not old enough, well, where did Moses get it from? All right, well, God is pre-trib, so, so that's why we have it in the books. We might as well uh, go ahead and dismiss And Lord, we're thankful for your blessings, and Lord, your goodness of what you've given to us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to all these things, Lord, and receive all the, the truths that you give us. And uh, Lord, we look forward to, to that trump blowing. In Jesus' name, amen.